What's cracking, big dopes? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. As always, every Wednesday, I am joined with my man's Noah at FB God on Twitter. Make sure you are following the both of us. Today, we are going to do some dynasty roster evaluations. Now, the redraft leagues are almost over. We can't give you trade targets videos. Obviously, uh, it's week 15, so there is two matchups left if you are lucky and you get into the championship. However, however, the dynasty leagues are open for business year-round. Thus, it's time to start thinking. What are we doing in the offseason? What kind of roster moves are we making? Are we making trades? Now, I know a lot of you guys play a lot of different settings when it comes to Dynasty. And I'm actually uh, – I'm not going to say I'm a seasoned veteran when it comes to Dynasty. I've only been playing for a couple of years now. So I'm interested in people's league settings because Dynasty is so diverse and it's very customizable to how long – some of you guys have been playing for like 10 or 15 years. I didn't even realize Dynasty was a thing for that long. But a lot of you guys have a lot of weird odd settings. So I'm curious if you guys – uh, are in a dynasty league that has something uh, of an obscure league setting, uh, drop that comment down below. Let us know what it is. And I kind of want to see um, if there are any interesting caveats that we could possibly add to our leagues. Now, uh, we do not have a trade deadline in most of the leagues that I am in. So it's, it's, it's open season for all of the teams right now. And what we're going to do, hopefully y'all have some trade uh, deadlines not yet closed so you can make some of the moves that we suggest or maybe wait until the offseason to do so so basically we asked you guys to present us with your dynasty roster the team that you currently have the future picks that you have we're going to look at them we're going to break down maybe some uh, suggestions that we might think for direction going forward into the future what kind of trades you can make guys that we would suggest maybe selling high or buying low on or something like that uh, so hopefully this helps y'all out uh, we have taken a few pictures from the rosters that were sent in. So thank you all for sending those in, of course. And you guys can do that. Uh, Noah wants to voluntarily uh, help you out with your Dynasty rosters on Patreon. So if you are a Patreon member, patreon.com slash B-D-G-E, you can sign up there, put your rosters onto the community tab, and Noah will help you uh, probably throw, throw away your franchise. <laughs> Today, we are going to get into Lloyd Farrell's Dynasty roster. First that fucking intro all right so first up we got our boy lloyd lloyd farrell's roster and just reading his patreon post it's he's in a 12 team half ppr league where they start one quarterback two running backs three receivers tight end flex kicker defense which I don't think either of us knew that many dynasty leagues had kickers or really, I know mine don't have defenses. I'm not sure about yeah, you, but I would, I would jump in there. And if, if, I mean, I'm not a fan of kickers in redraft or dynasty. Um, if you are creating a dynasty league this off season, I would highly, highly recommend you exclude defense and kickers altogether as roster spots in your league. That's just a quick caveat. Yeah, I completely agree. So he's also upset, as shown by his emoji, that he owns Todd Gurley, and I would be too. And this is how his roster is shaping up. So at quarterback, he's got Cam Newton, Drew Brees, Teddy Bridgewater, Hodges, uh, running back Gurley, Carrion Johnson, Royce Freeman, Lindsey. I'm assuming that's Ty Johnson, Daryl Henderson, Jordan Wilkins, wide receiver, Diggs, Cooper, you Watkins. Put the, uh, you couldn't put the Y in there, Lloyd? It was, just, it was one more letter. Yeah, come on, man. Who did you think it was besides – T. John, like who? What other T. Johnson? Could have <laughs> I don't know. I've never seen somebody call him just T. Johnson when there's just one more letter to put in. Thanks. Uh, John Ross, MVS, Aguilar, Conley, Zay Jones. Then he's got three awesome tight ends in Waller, Hooper, Ingram, and Cahill Waring. And I don't think we're going to give any advice on the defense and kickers because, I mean, what advice is there to give? Just get a young kicker on a good offense and your defenses look fine. So um, the first thing I'll say about this team is there's really no continuity here. You have a bunch of guys like Drew Brees is probably your starting quarterback right now. And when he went down, you had Teddy Bridgewater. Um, those Drew Brees himself is like slowly leaving his prime while you have running backs like uh, Todd Gurley, who I would also say is on the latter half of his prime. But you have Kerryon Johnson, who I know is always injured. He's like 22 years old. So he's like entering his prime. As for your receivers, they're like at their peak. So you have a bunch of guys who are either leaving their prime, entering their prime or at their peaks. And me personally, when I have all those different variables, I want to kind of um, lineate, if that makes sense. Like, I want to get everybody that's either going into their prime uh, or either at their peak. And when I see somebody try to move past their peak, like a Drew Brees, um, like a Todd Gurley, who's moving to the latter half of his career just because of his injuries, even though he's fairly young, 
Um, I'm going to try to ship them off and be a little proactive and try to get younger pieces. And also, it's a league where you start one tight end, and I know you can put you can play two, uh, one in the tight end spot, one in the flex. And I definitely wouldn't hate having, like, Evan Ingram and then putting Hooper in the flex. And the fact that you have three plus Cahill Waring, who we both like as a young prospect, um, I would try to move, like, a Darren Waller for maybe one of those second-year breakout receivers like uh, J.J. Arcega-Whiteside, uh, uh, Nikhil Harry, a Paris Campbell. So when you have Stephon Diggs and Amari Cooper – leaving their prime or, you know, I think they're 26, 25, 26 right now. So the next three or four years, as they're getting a bit older, you have a guy who's going into his second year right now that you might not think is that valuable. But we see guys like uh, Michael Gallup, DJ Chark, uh, even DJ Moore, like make that step. You have another guy in maybe a J.J. Arcega Whiteside or Nikhil Harry that will be at Stephon Diggs' current level uh, in the near future. And as for quarterback, you have Breeze and Bridgewater. I necessarily don't think like Bridgewater is really the answer in New Orleans because we saw this year, right? He was set up to succeed and he wasn't like that top 12 fantasy quarterback that you hope for. Um, maybe you move that package of Bridgewater and Breeze to a team that's in contention right now for a younger quarterback, maybe like a Daniel Jones, um, maybe like a Josh Allen. I know his price might be a little bit too high, but get somebody who maybe isn't performing up to snuff right now so that when the rest of your team is in your prime, you have a quarterback that has weapons around them and that is – you know, close to 30 aging and, um, you know, has a good team around him that will bring fantasy production. Yeah. I mean, when I look at the team, I see, uh, I see a lot of holes almost enough to the point where like, even if your team is fully healthy at full strength, you're not competing for a championship next year, which tells me that you're probably going to have to look towards a little bit of a rebuild. Um, because I mean, Cam and Drew, Sure, like you'll get a quarterback out of one of those guys, but long term, neither of those guys are the answer. And the problem behind them is like, we don't know if Teddy Bridgewater is really the answer behind Drew Brees either, at least from a fantasy perspective. Like he might come in and run the Saints franchise for the next three to five years after Brees retires, but from a, a fantasy, you know, thing, are, are we sure he's any more than like Andy Dalton during, you know, 2011 to 2014 or 15 or whatever? The running backs too kind of scare me a little bit because you have Todd Gurley as like your one. And of course, he's a guy that we're trying to chip off right now I do say like I, I like the young core of wide receivers that you have here between uh Diggs and Cooper those are obviously two very valuable wide receiver assets in dynasty with tight ends you, you I mean you're you're great with tight ends and I think having a good uh group of tight ends like this is super advantageous in dynasty because like tight end is just such a limited position and there's only about eight or nine guys that you feel comfortable starting on any given week and you basically have three of the nine which kind of gives you a monopoly over the position, which means you have value and you have leverage there in terms of moving them. Like he said, I kind of like the idea of rolling with Hooper and Ingram as very young tight ends, one in your tight end spot, one in your flex moving forward. I would probably be, look, be looking to move Darren Waller. What I would say from a dynasty perspective, just from the start, is like second round draft picks are your best friend because people devalue them, but you get a, a ton of value in those second round picks. And I'm looking at some ADP just from – uh, just from like this year's draft guys that you probably could have gotten in the second round this year, uh, Debo Samuel, Marquise Brown, um, like guys like that, like Andy Isabella, long-term J, uh, JJ Arcega, Whiteside, Miles, not Miles Sanders, uh, like Justice Hill, Devin Singletary even kind of went to the second round. Um, so it, it's like a lot of building, building block pieces that kind of go under the radar that you can use long-term. So the way I'm looking at it, like I'm probably trying to move Gurley for a few set, maybe like two second round picks and a third round pick. Um, carry on Johnson is a guy that you could probably leverage for a lot of value as well. Maybe see if you could flip carry on for a first round pick this year, because there's going to be a very, very, very strong class for offensive players at both running back and wide receiver. And the fact that, you know, it is a one quarterback league. You don't really need to focus too much on the quarterback position because you know, they'll come and go. Um, I think since you're in the rebuild, I mean, it's not necessarily a team that you're going to have to try to win a championship with right away. Um, so I don't know. Gurley and carry on, although they are like the one and two on your team, I'm probably looking to move them for pieces. I think Darren Waller is probably a piece that I would look to move as well to a team, maybe competing for a championship this upcoming year. You might be able to flip him plus maybe like a third round pick because you own all of your draft picks except this upcoming year's first, which fucking hurts, obviously. So maybe you can use Darren Waller plus a second to move up to a first or Darren Waller plus a third to move up to a first. But my, my first inkling of what I would do is probably try to move those top three guys, Gurley, carry on Darren Waller, see how many firsts and second that you could uh, scrounge up from this. Because I think even if you have like the 108 to 110, you're going to be able to get a piece that's probably a starting running back and maybe two starting wide receivers off the rip. 
And then once you can start building around like an RB1, Diggs, Amari Cooper, a nice wide receiver three, plus you have two really good tight ends, you'll probably start moving in the right direction. And the fact that you have your other picks going forward in the future is good. And I voiced last week when we did like the trade targets video, maybe two weeks ago, why I'm not sold on carry on as like a future RB1. Um, a lot of things just with that Detroit offense, him continually getting hurt after Matt Patricia said he didn't want to work him into the ground, keeps ending the season on the IR. Um, so I, I never really see a, a chance for carry on to be the workhorse back again, no matter how talented he is. So I would try to sell him at that RB1 value because there's somebody in Dynasty that still loves carry on Johnson based on the talent. So I think um, I think just the fact that you're probably not going to be able to compete tells me that you need to start moving towards a rebuild. Now, I'm, I'll, I'll be first, <coughs> I'll preface by saying like, I'm never in favor of a full rebuild where I just get rid of like all my players just to have, you know, 15 draft picks in this upcoming rookie draft, because listen, you're going to hit on 50%. You're going to miss on 50%. And I'd rather, uh, I'd rather just not do that. I'd rather keep my core pieces of my dynasty team, like together here, like Diggs, Cooper, Ho Cooper, Hooper, Ingram, and those guys who will be staples. Like you need staples on your, on your roster that, you know, week in week out will produce for you and will continue to hold value because they're so young on your team. So my suggestion, yeah, would be to start um, moving those pieces. And, like, since your quarterback situation is a little fucked right now, I mean, it could work both ways. Brees can come back and, and play fine, like maybe, like, top 12 guy next year. Cam can get traded to, like, the Bucks and end up being um, a, a good starter for you. I don't know if I trust the foot right now after waiting so long to get the surgery. But if things break right, maybe in one of those trades you, you ask for, like, a back-end um, – quarterback that's maybe like a top 15 to 18 option and they can you know hopefully help you streaming from week to week next year so that would probably be my my initial moves for you yeah the other point I want to bring up is you actually have the handcuff to Todd Gurley and Daryl Henderson and I know Scott had told us that he traded Todd Gurley for carry on and a 2021 first and I know those 2021 picks are less valuable than the 2020s just because they're so far away but if you can get that value just for Gurley I mean if you add his handcuff you could easily get a first round pick for him and then as the draft rolls around, you could probably flip that first for a guy like Joe Mixon, like after the combine happens, after the draft happens, like people are really devaluing young, productive running backs like a Joe Mixon, just because they had a bad year. When you look at the situation, right, like the offensive line, they had good pieces. They all got hurt this year. They had QB struggles. Um, just the team as a whole really struggled under their new OC in their very first year or their new coach in their very first year. I think you could also leverage the picks that you acquire and the picks that you have, right? Because you said you're the 101, which means your second round pick is the 201. You could probably flip that second round pick for an, a pretty strong uh, wide receiver right after the combine because once people start to see these guys run four fours, four threes, uh, you know, jump out the gym, they want to get all those players that they can acquire. Um, so you can trade them for more, you know, proven assets in the NFL right now. So I completely agree with Nick. I would definitely build around Diggs, Cooper, Engram, and Hooper just because they're young, they're productive, they're in pretty good offenses that we know are going to produce. And if you can just get younger pieces around them that are going to break out one to two years from now, uh, I think you'll be in a really good position to compete in the playoffs. Yeah, I would also say, like, just going on that point of keeping those four players, when, when I look at my dynasty rosters, for instance, in, like, the Go Fade Me Dynasty League, we have our semifinals matchup this week. But, like, our trade deadline's never closed. When I'm looking at trading, I have probably – and this, this is the case for most of my dynasty leagues – like, I know you should always be, like, open to answering phone calls and always be opening to trading guys because there's always a price. But for the most part, there are guys on my team that are, like, will not be on the trade block. Like, I have – it's super flex. So, I have Russell Wilson. I won't trade him. I just won't because I like to build my team around four players. No matter if you, you offer me great value, I'm like, I don't want to trade just for the sake of trading. So, like, Russell Wilson, Joe Mixon, who you, uh, who you touched on, Austin Eckler, and Cortland Sutton are basically the four guys, the pillars of my young team – that are basically just off the trade block unless I get something that's kind of, um, you know, that just blows me away. And I have other guys, like I have Melvin Gordon, and Julian Edelman, Julio Jones, Zach Ertz, Adam Thielen, Damian Williams, and guys like that who have value right now, but they're older. So I don't care. They're not like off my do not trade list because within a year or two, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have wished that I did move them. So that, that's just like a rule of thumb for me. When I'm drafting my dynasty team or when I have my dynasty team, I'm thinking about trading players. Like, I, I think you should make a do not trade list of players that you're just going to continuously build your team around. So once you have your set pillars of four or five guys, you can work on the pieces around them. But if you keep moving things, you know, you end up with no identity on your team, which is kind of where you're at right now. Yeah. And just talking about players that you should not trade, we move on to the second roster. And this guy's team, I don't know if he's in like a three-man league, a four-man league. This guy's team is absolutely incredible. He doesn't have a single player that 
well, obviously I, I trade a few of them, but he doesn't have a single player that I like wouldn't trust week after week to start, right? Lamar Jackson, Devonta Adams, Cortland Sutton, Barkley, Aaron Jones, Kittle, Tyler Boyd on his bench. I mean, he has Kyler Murray. He has Debo Samuel, uh, Royce Freeman. He has Aaron Rodgers too. This team has all players that, like his quarterbacks, Lamar Jackson and Kyler Murray, have like 10-year windows that they can be QB1s and really produce for you. All his receivers, except for Devonta Adams, are 25 and under. And Devonta like, just turned 27. His running backs are like 22, 23 years old. This entire team is fantastic. And because of that, I would say just pretty much hold tight. The only suggestion I would make is since this is a one QB league and you have Jackson and you have Kyler Murray, move I would try Rogers. to – what happened? I was going to say move Rodgers. Yeah, move Rodgers because he's older, right? And the team that's trying to compete – I know it's a one quarterback league and the team that's competing right now probably already has a good quarterback, but the name value of him alone, you could probably net like maybe a second-round pick or maybe one of those year two receivers in a package deal. Uh, you get them in a throw-in to really help that depth even more, even though you have like five really good receivers. And for picks, he also has the 1-5 this year and two 2020 seconds. The fact that he has Barkley and Aaron Jones, I know a lot of people say that, like, Aaron Jones may not come back to Green Bay after next year when he's a free agent. But every time the guy's on the field, he produces. The offense looks so much better when he's there. I'd be surprised if he doesn't come back. But if you want to hedge your bets, with that 1-5, they're basically, like, four really, really good running backs this year that I'm pretty sure will produce no matter the situation unless they're, like, in Miami. Um, and Cam Akers, uh, Jonathan Taylor, DeAndre Swift. Uh, even like you can throw in J.K. Dobbins in there, like uh, Travis Etienne, whichever one of those guys falls to you and whichever one is in a really good situation, I would just draft them at the 1-5 or like we said before, just trade for a Joe Mixon because even though you have like two really good running backs and you have Royce Freeman, I wouldn't hate to add a little bit more depth through the draft. And then with those 20-20 seconds, maybe take a shot on a tight end. I'm not sure like if there are any great ones this year. It's definitely not as deep as last year's class, but um, in the, if you have a late second, maybe take a shot there or just add like a Jalen Rager, a young receiver, or again, just trade a pick for like a wide receiver coming off of a down year. I would say like a Tyler Boyd, but you already have them. So. Yeah. I like the tight ends he has right now between Kittle and Herndon. Those are two like guys that you definitely want in fantasy. I mean, the fact that you have Jackson and Murray basically sets you up for success at quarterback for the next like eight years. So there's really no reason to hold on to Rodgers when he is a valuable asset. And I think his value in dynasty leagues is only going to go down from here. So I would try to move him off my roster as soon as possible. If you can get an early second for Rodgers in a one quarterback league, I would absolutely do that. Yeah. And, and just going back on Aaron Jones, like you can never have enough running backs on your team because running backs in dynasty, it's like, I mean, you could always run out to the waiver wire and grab the handcuff in, in a redraft league, but you can't do that in dynasty. So even the guys that you have on your bench, like the Freemans, the Jalen Samuels, the Duke Johnsons, it's, it's not like you could stream running backs in dynasty, but the fact that you always end up owning like five or six backups means that between the course of the entire season, like you'll be able to play one or two of them as you're running back to a couple of weeks out of the year. So I love the idea of just like stockpiling kind of high upside um, backup running backs in dynasty, especially when you have your core piece of like Saquon Barkley there with Aaron Jones. Yeah. I'm, I'm a little more nervous about him in, in dynasty. Loved him in redraft this year, but I think we've seen that they just want to use, uh, committee approach and uh, you know who knows what happened maybe they start devaluing the running back and they just kind of let Aaron Jones walk once they hit free agency and maybe draft like a third or fourth round guy we'll have to see but yeah I mean I would I would flip Rodgers for um, for an early second if you can and then dra draft one of the running backs in this in this year's class you have a you have a lot to work with and I'm assuming this team is competing for a championship right now um, so you're you're set up pretty well so this next team comes in from Matt Keen. Thank you, Matthew, for the support. Dynasty Week 15, shit show. What's up, big dogs? My Dynasty team is stuck in mediocrity. I've been in the playoffs the past two years, but I knew I didn't have a shot at the chip. Do I blow it up or do I reload and go for it in 2020? It's a 12-team half PPR. Single quarterback. The rest are pretty standard scoring settings, which you could read on the screen. At quarterbacks, he has Winston, Allen, Darnold, Stafford, running backs, Derrick Henry, Eckler, Penny, Raquel, Darrell Henderson, y'all can read the rest. Wide receivers, core is made up of Lockett, Diggs, Westbrook, Nikhil Harry, and some other guys. Tight end, Derek Cook, McDonald, Everett Brait, Josh Oliver. So, a few of the things I notice first. Love the core of quarterbacks that you have. Uh, really like the core of running backs that you have. Wide receivers is a mix. Uh, you don't have any stud right there, but I think it's enough young talent you could work with. Tight ends, you do not have a tight end of the future, unfortunately. But you do have two firsts. You do have two seconds, which is very, very good for you right now. Um, again, guys, with Dynasty, I, I don't think there's – there's very rarely an instance where I think you need to go extreme on one or the other end of the spectrum. 
Like, you're definitely not blowing this team up. Like, this team is a playoff team year in and year out. You're a couple pieces away or a couple lucky things happening away from you being in the championship game. I would say that you need a wide receiver one, and you definitely need at least like a top, uh, a, a top 12 tight end going into next year. Because Jared Cook's been good this year, um, but who knows how long you're going to be able to depend on him. So, no, you're definitely not going to blow it up. Because like I said before, you, you take your key pieces that you do not want to give away and you build around them. And for me, you're looking at Derrick Henry and you're looking at Austin Eckler, who we talked about last week, how Melvin Gordon is going to be elsewhere this offseason. Eckler will likely get re-signed by the Chargers. He's a restricted free agent, so he might stay with the Chargers. He might go elsewhere, but wherever he goes, he's going to have a very prominent role just because he's been so good. Um, you know, your, your depth at running back is obviously a little less than ideal, but I think between Lockett, Diggs, uh, Nikhil Harry, who I expect to be a phenomenal by low candidate this offseason that's a guy I, I would uh, Diggs and Harry are the two wide receivers that would be on my do not trade list and then obviously a quarterback we'll see what happens with Winston um, but Allen and Darnold should be able to hold you for the future the way I look at this team I, I like I think the rookie draft this year you, you having four picks within the top 209 will will let you rebuild because in the 103 with the 103 you'll be able to get a legitimate RB1 who's starting for a team this upcoming year because like you said you have you know, DeAndre Swift, you have Jonathan Taylor, you have all these guys who are going to step into wherever they go and, and go right into an 18 to 22 touch the workload. And I think there, there's so many talented guys. So even if you were, were worried about Eckler being like your RB2, you now have a guy that you can put ahead of him and then move Eckler to the flex spot to pair up with Derrick Henry. Wide receivers, obviously they take a little bit longer to develop. And at the 109 and 203, you could probably grab two wide receivers that over time will develop into wide receiver twos, maybe wide receiver ones if you, you know, if it breaks right and you hit lucky. Um, but I think, like, I think you're a year, maybe two years away from competing for a championship again. You do lack, like, that high upside wide receiver and tight end to probably put you into the championship. But I think you're right there. And I think you have enough picks right now where you definitely don't need to blow it up, but you also don't need to trade away all your guys to get – you know, those high upside guys that will get you to the championship. I think you're, you're, you're borderline the top four team in your league, I'm sure, based on the roster right here. And uh, for the future, I think you're okay because you have that core four or five guys that you really want to hold on to. Yeah, we saw that team earlier with three really good tight ends, and I doubt that's the same case for you in this league. But if you look at the tight ends that you have, right, you have a guy like Everett who has, you know, pretty good upside going forward, and Jared Cook who's, like, in a win-now mode type of – like, if you have a team with a win-now mode, you're not against acquiring Jared Cook. I would probably try to move one of those two guys depending – like if a team has more than one good tight end and they're in win now mode, maybe package Jared Cook in your 209 to get a guy like a Darren Waller or maybe an Everett in your 209 if it's more of a rebuilding team for a good tight end. Or even you see all those running backs you have, right? Rashad Penny, Raquel Armstead, Daryl Henderson, Damian Harris. All those guys are handcuffs to pretty good young running backs. If you can convince the owner of one of those starters to take one of those guys and your like second round pick, turn that into a tight end, so then you have like a legitimate tight end. And like Nick said, you have two pretty good receivers. You have two good running backs. Add another through the draft and you have really good uh, quarterbacks. I think that'll set you up pretty well. So I would definitely target a tight end first. Um, and with your 103, go for a running back. And then just take shots on wide receivers with your, you know, your late first, your early second, because this is a super deep class. And I would bet that with the 109 to, like and your 203, you can hit on somebody there. Because, you know, as we brought up early, we saw this year, like Debo Samuel hit and he was a second round pick. Marquise Brown hit as a second round pick. Uh, Terry McLaurin as like a third round pick he hit. So, uh, and if this class is going to be deeper than last year's class, just go for a guy who's productive in college, athletic, lands in a good spot. And, you know, maybe all those guys don't land to you at the 109 or 203, but there's certainly going to be a few that fall under the radar uh, after the draft. And I agree. Nikhil Harry is a prime by candidate. And the fact that you have him on your team, um, you just got to keep your fingers crossed that next year he enters the year healthy. And he's, he's going to be a beast if he's healthy because he's so good. And he's already flashed like, um, his ability to win in contested situations. He's good after the catch. He had a touchdown called back from him last uh, week where he had a pretty good run after the catch. So I think in the next one to two years, you're going to be a competitor if you go out and acquire a tight end and you hit on a few of those picks that you have. Yeah, I like – it seems like you had a lot of rookie picks this year between Raquel Armstead, Darrell Henderson, Damian Harris, and you kind of went in on those running backs, and unfortunately you didn't really hit on any of them. Um, so if you're going to move them, I, I, would, I would probably hold on to those core of running backs just because I, I think one out of the three will probably emerge next year and be, be usable. I'm not sure who it's going to be. I'm not sure if there's going to be injuries that make it happen. Um, but like I said, I like holding on to those backup running backs because at one point or another, again, you've got to look at these players as like, uh, like the stock market. Their values go up and down like weekly. And a lot of people, I mean, any dynasty league you're in, there are people that love to trade and there are people that stand pat with their team. People that love to trade, 
they are, they're way more volatile. They look at things in the short term. So when one of these players, like, you know, um, I, I don't know. I don't think Damian Harris is that good of a talent, but like say Sony Michelle gets hurt next year. Damian Harris is like the starter. I don't like Damian Harris long-term. So you might be able to flip him for something. Cause someone's like, Oh, Damian Harris is the starter for new England. Now, same thing with Darrell Henderson. who's not a running back that I loved coming into the year. Just, I just never thought he was that good in college. I thought the offensive line was amazing, which made his four, four speed, obviously produce historic numbers. But like, he's a guy where if he gets a shot and he has a couple good games, his value spikes up and people might like him in the long term more than you like him. So I think with those backup running backs, like it just takes one or two good games in order for you to squeeze all the value you could possibly get out of them. But yeah, like you said, one or two years, I think you're fine. You just need, it's crazy looking at your roster in the beginning of the year and at the end of the year and like how things play out because it takes one game, it takes one injury, it takes one coaching change for one player to go from like, you know, your wide receiver two to a guy that's helping you compete for a championship. So the fact that you have these pieces makes me feel like you just got to stay where you're at, um, keep riding it out and building a, a really strong core, which is kind of where you're at right now. Yeah, and building off of what you said on the flip side, kind of like waiting for an injury to happen. If like Matthew Stafford is declared as being like healthy going into next year, and if like Jameis Winston gets re-signed to Tampa Bay, those are two guys we've seen be top 12 quarterbacks. And there are going to be people in your leagues trying to buy those two uh, pieces. And the fact that you have Sam Darnold, but you have Josh Allen. Obviously, Allen's a little bit better of a piece than Sam Darnold. If you move one of those two guys between Winston and Stafford, you can probably acquire some pretty good, like uh, a young receiver going into his second year that we keep bringing up, somebody that has a chance to break out next year. Um, maybe a guy like Tyler Boyd, you throw in a pick with that deal and you get like a young wide receiver that could be a pretty solid wide receiver three for this team. So, um, yeah, I agree with Nick. If you can't get good enough value out of one of those handcuff running backs pre-draft, just wait till next year, wait till an injury occurs because – a lot of those running backs that you drafted, the handcuffs, like Rashad Penny, he's behind a guy we've seen get injured a lot. Same with Raquel Armstead behind Fournette, Daryl Henderson behind Todd Gurley, and even Damian Harris behind Sonny Michelle. You have a bunch of guys who are backups to very injury-prone running backs. So, yeah, if you just wait till next year, you can probably flip them for a lot more, especially if when they like, – It's like if Leonard Fournette gets hurt, Raquel Armstead takes over as a workhorse, but, like, the value that you can get from him in Dynasty is way higher – than what he's actually going to do for your dynasty team over the long term. Like he's not going to be the the workhorse for the next three years if Leonard Fournette gets hurt. You know what I mean? He's going to have like a good probably like eight to ten week run maybe as like an RB two for you in dynasty, and then that's probably all the juice you can really squeeze out of him as a fifth round pick. You can get much more value from him in a trade. Mm -hmm. I completely agree with that. Yeah. So maybe just wait it out with those running backs and see what happens, and then trade yeah. them when the starter inev inevitably gets hurt. All right, we're going to move on to the last team, and this is from. My editor, Scott, and our Go Fade Me team, uh, a team in which I just fucking thrashed in the first round of the playoffs. Close your ears. Close your ears. So, yeah, I'm sorry, Scott. You're muff, baby. You know, I love you. <laughs> so, Scott's roster, admittedly, uh, I think from top to bottom, Scott might have the best roster in our league, uh, considering both this year as well as into the future. He has a very strong starting lineup. He lacks that high-end RB1 or that high-end wide receiver one since Cooper Cup is, you know, his play has kind of fallen down. But with Lamar Jackson, Sam Darnold, and Josh Allen, and even Dwayne Haskins, who we don't know what he's really going to become, this is a super flex league. So he has four really good starting quarterbacks, and those guys are going to cement his team for the next 10 years. His running backs get a little, a, a little crazy here because Scott is one of those guys that loves to trade, Right. And my advice to Scott would be don't trade for the sake of trading. I would stay where you're at right now because Scott's team, not only does he have those quarterbacks, but his wide receivers, Calvin Ridley, Cooper Cup, Tyler Boyd, Terry McLaurin, A.J. Brown, Christian Kirk. He, he, without a doubt, has the best wide receiver core for the future in our league, and it's not even close. And he has four first-round picks in this upcoming draft as well as two second-round picks. So, uh, he will be competing for a championship. I would actually be surprised if he does not win our championship next year because he's going to have um, the 102. Oh, God. He's going to have like the 102, the 103, the 106, and then probably like the 111 or 112. So he's going to get like two workhorse running backs to replace Gurley and some of these guys. So the takeaway from Scott is also like he doesn't have Zach Ertz anymore because he just traded Zach Ertz to me for TJ Hawkinson, because we don't have a trade deadline in this league. I would just say don't get too jumpy on the gun when you're talking about trades. Like, look at your team objectively. If you pulled back and I looked at this roster, I would be fucking pumped because you have a team full of young guys that have the upside of being absolute studs for the next five to seven years, plus so much draft capital going into this draft. So, Scott, I give you one piece of advice for the rest of the summer. 
Do not fucking make a trade unless it's giving me Terry McLaurin or AJ Brown. Besides that, don't make any more trades for the sake of making trades. You're getting into the Yannick degenerate camp now who has traded away his entire team. Thus is why he's in like ninth place and probably will be for a long, long time. So you're sitting pretty. I know it's dynasty. I know it's hard to be patient, but your team is fucking incredible. And you have the draft capital to make it an elite team in our league. Yeah. I was going to say my only advice would be don't trade, but also please send trades because in my league, his roster is exactly the same. And he has nine first round picks and his receivers are like Godwin, Amari Cooper, DJ Moore. And then he has, I think AJ Brown too. And Cortland Sutton, like his team's ridiculous. The way you built your team, Scott, Looking at your running backs, it's the obvious weak point. But still, you have Todd Gurley, who or you traded him away for carry on Johnson, you said, we also don't like. But you can easily clean up that running back situation because you have the 102, the 103. You get two guys that, like DeAndre Swift, people are just penciling him in to land in Kansas City. If he lands in Kansas City, he probably won't be available to you at the 102. But like even a Jonathan Taylor or whatever, you're going to have a very That's solid I'm running back core. DeAndre. DeAndre Swift, when we did last summer leading up to the Dynasty Guide, when we did our Dynasty Guide, which will be on sale semi-soon for pre-orders. We're going to be doing an entire rookie dynasty draft guide that will help you, you know, obviously we'll, we'll give you rankings and write-ups on our favorite players. But going into last year, DeAndre Swift was my 101. And I don't think it's, it's going to shift at all, regardless of this landing spot. Like he could go to Miami at pick whatever they have, 23 or 24. I think they have multiple picks in the first. If they take him in, in the first round, DeAndre Swift will probably be my 101. I just, I like him more in today's style of running back. I see him as more like a Dalvin Cook. Whereas Jonathan Taylor obviously has like that Derrick Henry, Leonard Fournette build and probably a better runner than both of them. I don't know. I just, I love DeAndre Swift, but yeah, point remains like you're going to be able to get a couple of these studs and your weakness right now is not having that high end RB one on your roster, but you have, you have all of the, like the rookies from last year that you wanted as handcuffs, Madison, Tony Pollard, Darrell Henderson. If one of the guys ahead of them goes down at any point, like we were talking about on the, on the previous roster, like, there you go. You just have your fill in RB two, RB one, for the remainder of the season. So, yeah, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm, going, I'm going all out this year to win the championship because I feel like Scott kind of controls our league for the next three years. Yeah, and another point you brought up, like he doesn't have an elite wide receiver one because Cooper Cup's kind of fallen off a bit. But if you look at the depth he has, like he's going to be able to start Cup, Ridley, Boyd, and like between A.J. Brown, Christian Kirk, and Terry McLaurin next year. Like if you have that much depth in a dynasty league where you can start, what, four wide receivers, you don't need like a cemented like top three receiver if every single guy you have is top 24. So yeah, the, the other thing I would say, me and Scott made a trade. We're, we're filming this on Tuesday. We made a trade this morning. Uh, you'll, you'll got, you guys will be watching this on Wednesday. We made a trade yesterday where I got Zach Ertz from him. I gave up TJ Hawkinson. We swapped our third round pick. So he moved up like eight spots or so, which is really, it's kind of like a moot point. Um, so it, I, if I were him, I wouldn't have made that trade. Not because I think like Ertz is so much better than Hawkinson at, in dynasty value right now, but the fact that you're going to be able to compete for a championship like next year immediately, I would much rather have Ertz in my starting lineup than, uh, than TJ Hawkinson. Although Hawkinson obviously is very, very young. I just didn't like what we saw from Hawkinson at all in Detroit. I don't know how much better it's going to get, despite how much we liked him in the beginning of the year. Uh, so he gave away Ertz, which obviously hurts his starting lineup a little bit. And I think your starting lineup was ready to compete for a championship immediately next year. So that was something I would not really have done. Um, and then he actually he made a great trade to get Ridley and Ertz from Snacks. Snacks made a fucking awful trade. Gave up Ridley, Ertz, got like, I, I don't Eli even Manning. remember the players that he got in return. Um, and he also, yeah, he also just gave up Noah Fant in a trade to acquire Todd Gurley, which was for the playoff run, so I understand. But if you knew you were giving away Zach Ertz and you kind of put yourself in a bad spot where you don't have um, tight ends of uh, to, to dominate kind of next year in your roster – yeah, I also agree with that because we see Zach Ertz, right? He's like 29 or 30 years old. We've seen guys like Greg Olson and Delaney Walker, you know, into the 32, 33-year-old season be fairly productive and be tight end ones. Even if Zach Ertz's play falls off a bit, which I know he's picked it up a little bit, bit, a little bit this year, but in the beginning of the year, it fell off a bit and he was still a tight end one. And the fact that you have Irv Smith, I would have just kept him. And as he starts to decline, just roll with Irv Smith because he's shown some pretty good flashes. He's a young, uh, very athletic tight end on a team that's – he's probably going to be the tight end one four because – you know, Kyle Rudolph is getting a bit older. Oh, I forgot he's got Irv Smith too. So he does have a lot of good young tight ends. So Snacks gave away Calvin Ridley and Zach Ertz. In return, he got John Ross, Jay Sternberger, Hakeem Butler, uh, a second rounder in 2020, a second rounder in 2021, and a third rounder in 2021. So 
the best thing he got was an upcoming 2020 draft pick. Um, John Ross, you can argue that, yeah, he's a good dynasty value right now, but like Jay Sternberger, or Keen Butler to give up a guy like Ridley and Zach Ertz to get those guys. Like you didn't get one concrete piece that's going to help you win like right now, or, I mean, second round picks, like I said, are great, but they're, they're further into the future. And I just feel like that devalues them a little bit. So it was a great trade for, um, for Scott there. And then he ended up flipping Ertz, but he does have a lot of really good talent, young talent at the tight end position. I just think the way your team is built, you probably would have wanted something that could put you up, you know, double digit points as early as next year. And we don't know if we're going to get that from Hawkinson. We don't know if we're going to get that um, from Irv Smith, but otherwise, I mean, you, this is fucking textbook way of building your dynasty roster. You've made so many fucking trades at this point that I don't even know like where the, the core of your team was built or like what was the turning point of where your trades, you know, started making you a fucking powerhouse, but it's looking good now. And uh and yeah, I would, I would just wait until the rookie draft. And, and the other thing, too, is, like, if you have picks in the offseason that you're looking to move, I would wait until around the NFL draft or around your rookie draft because people are going to love guys. Like, there will be someone who loves, you know, Darrell Henderson, someone who doesn't. So if you have a guy who thinks Darrell Henderson was, like, a top-five rookie pick last year, obviously that was a bad pick, but you could have sold that pick to him at a higher value because he likes rookie. He likes this rookie. You don't like this rookie. So if you don't see a guy on the board that you like, like I think you get a lot more value on draft day for those trades, you know? Yeah. I've seen people on Twitter already talk about like somebody offered somebody else a first round pick to give up Odell Beckham jr. And the guy that was, whatever it was like, they weren't taking Odell for a first round pick. And I think that's crazy because I think Odell will be better than any guy that's going to be picked in this year because he's a generational talent. We've seen him. It depends where that pick was. If I could take one of the workhorse running backs, those top three pick, I would probably take that over Odell right now, to be honest. Yeah, I think I just would roll with Odell, but that's just like the value that they have that like three, four months out, people are already doing it. Like before we know where any of these running backs land, like as Nick said, like even if DeAndre Swift lands in Miami, sure, he's still going to be the 101 in rookie draft picks, but I would take Odell over him any day at that point. And the fact that those are being declined just shows how much value they hold this far away from the draft. So as the draft comes around and as your rookie draft comes around, those are going to hold extremely you know, high weight. Yeah. And, and just a rule of thumb that we've talked about the last couple of videos is like those wide receivers going into their second year, especially, especially the way this year worked out where the rookie wide receivers are off to like ridiculously good starts. All of the guys that didn't perform up to where you wanted them to, their value will be very much declined because they're just going to be compared to the guys who broke out this year, the AJ Browns, the Metcalfs, Terry McLaurin's and their value fucking goes like that, whereas you can now buy them on the cheap and they're just as likely to break out in their second or third year as a lot of the guys that do so, you know, in the NFL and the regular where they have those down rookie years and you could buy them um, coming into the second year kind of on the cheap. So, yeah, I tweeted is- about that. And then some guy responded, he's like, I'm kind of nervous about JJ Sega Whiteside because he has no competition and he's not producing. And then Mike from your NYC league chimed in. He's like, well, look at about, look at DJ Chark from last year. He had no competition and now he's breaking out. So I think you got to look at like, how these past few years have went, how guys, even though they didn't have competition in their rookie year, like it takes more than one year to learn a position at a professional level. Like for most of these guys, don't just give up because they put up like 300 yards as a rookie. They caught up in the outliers of guys. Like, listen, if AJ Brown goes for over over a thousand yards this year, he's like one of six rookies of all time. So if someone that you like didn't do that, that's fucking normal. So listen, it takes time to develop these things. Plus wide receivers have such long, like lifetime, uh, like value in terms of yeah. trades because like even I mean even look at Devontae Parker Josh Gordon like you've had sell high or buy low whatever windows for like eight years on all of these guys so even like a J.J. Arcega Whiteside if next year he has a couple good games in a row and you still don't believe him as a player you'll have windows to sell him there are always windows in Dynasty again look at your players as assets and attack the player attack the people that look at Dynasty from a short-term standpoint always we good I- All right, well, that's all the Dynasty content we got for y'all today. Make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you're following both of us on Twitter. If you want to be involved in these videos um, and, you know, we could use y'all as examples or your rosters and whatnot, make sure you're signed up on patreon.com slash BDGE. We'll be doing a lot of of Dynasty content in the offseason, so subscribe to the channel if you are new and you play in Dynasty. If you don't, I would very much suggest you start a league up. Um, hopefully this off season I could figure out something where I can organize leagues for y'all. We tried last year, but the automation behind it was just too much work for us to do. But be looking out for something along those lines and just make sure you're following us on all the social medias to stay in tune. So until next time, 